My name is Gonzalo Artiach, and I'm a healthcare equity analyst here at ABG. Our next company is CAR Therapeutics, a, a Swedish biotech uh, focused on the development of treatments uh, for kidney injury. And today we have here with us uh, Tobias Agerwald, the CEO. Tobias, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Pleasure to be here and I'm happy to present on um, Guard Therapeutics. Um, so we're a small biotech company located here in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, and I'll give you the short version in about two minutes to summarize where we are and I think the key value points and the value proposition for us going forward. So as already mentioned, we are targeting an area um, called acute kidney injuries, which is in contrast to chronic kidney disease, more focus on, on the acute end. Um, the key area and the main focus right now is the subset of patients at risk for developing acute kidney injury, and that's patients undergoing open chest cardiac surgery, such as CABG and or heart valve surgery. We have recently initiated a large global phase two study in this space. Uh, we call that the Akita study. It's a very, I would say, significant and recognizable study where we plan to include 270 patients, but with the possibility to expand sample size up to 350 patients. So this is truly a, a global and large um, important study for us. This space in cardiac surgery, it's also very important, um, has an important commercial implication and opportunity. It's, it's the peak sales, no matter how we calculate this, goes above 1 billion US dollars. And that's actually largely driven by the high number of patients. So this is not an orphan disease. This is a very common disease with a high prevalence of acute kidney injury in these patients. There are also no approved therapies, uh, and we are actually uh, quite advanced now in development as compared to the competitor space um, with limited competition so far, even if that becomes more intense. Another um, important differentiating point for the company, we have shown preclinical efficacy, not only in, in models that are related immediately to acute kidney injury, but we actually have efficacy data in more than 10 different disease models both in AKI versus non-AKI models and in renal models versus non-renal models. So we truly believe that this, this is important sort of translational or effort to close the translational gap between uh, animals and humans. In our early phase program, which I will speak about, we uh, also have uh, nice data actually indicating that our lead molecule called RMCO35, also referred to sometimes as ROSGARD, uh, does protect the kidney cells uh, based on a biomarker analysis, and I will allude to that too. We also recently, based on our belief of this molecule, initiated a second clinical program in kidney transplantation. I will not focus on that today. Uh, that will be subject to, to another presentation. We are also a listed company on the Nasdaq First North growth market, uh, market cap uh, above, just above 300 million sec. So this is a micro cap company still. Our cash position by end of June is roughly half of that amount. So just briefly on acute kidney injury, we know this is a very uh, common manifestation, more than 13 million individuals being affected each year. Obviously high morbidity and mortality. We can't survive without the kidneys. If people develop a severe acute kidney injury, they may need dialysis treatment as a life-sustaining treatment. So there's really an important focus early on um, during the course. However, we also know that a lot of these patients actually, even if they partially recover uh, or if they don't need dialysis, they tend to lose a lot of kidney function chronically, which means they develop incident chronic kidney disease. Or in case they have a pre-existing chronic kidney disease, they also have uh, accelerated progression of disease. So we really think this is an important um, unmet medical need and large niche, which is with several benefits in terms of development. As mentioned, we are focusing in cardiac surgery patients. There's still about half a million uh, open chest cardiac surgeries being performed in EU um, and, and US each year. What is less known is that AKI is one of the most, actually the most common severe uh, end organ complication in this, where we think about, uh, it's estimated to about 30% of all patients going into surgery actually develop at least a mild stage of AKI. But this, this number can easily be increased by just predefining specific risk factors, such as diabetes, heart failure, and chronic kidney disease. So our solution to this um, is called RMCO35, uh, which we think is an innovative. It's a first-in-class drug, new molecular entity. It's never been evaluated before. Uh, obviously, we have uh, solid IP protection for this that expires in 2036, a composition of matter patents. 
This is a so-called biological candidate, which means that we produce this recombinantly in, in living cells rather than synthetically. Um, and um, the treatment duration, I think this is important because we're not targeting a long-term treatment or a chronic treatment with all what that means in terms of longer studies, longer follow-ups, more expensive development paths. We're actually targeting a short-term treatment only at the hospital in conjunction with, with the surgery, surgical procedure. So that means we're, we have the mandate to treat up for five days, but I will show you we only actually treat for, for two days in conjunction with, with the cardiac surgery. As already mentioned, we have very robust preclinical efficacy and we think the molecule is also ideal for AKI treatment. I don't have time to go into that today, but we think the mechanism of action of the molecule is very aligned with the main disease pathways in AKI. More importantly, it targets several pathways. So most importantly, the ischemic injury, but also a component we refer as heme toxicity, which is the result of hemolysis and release of free heme into the bloodstream that is toxic to the kidney. And we also target protection of mitochondria within the kidney proximal tubular cells. Thirdly, the molecule also has what we perceive as an ideal by distribution pattern because when we give this intravenously to patients into the bloodstream, it immediately traffics and goes into the kidney, which means that the molecule actually ends up exactly in the cells we're trying to protect. So we built a clinical development program specifically with this in mindset, both for AKI and cardiac surgery, but also that where we have the freedom to expand and go into different patient segments, not only in cardiac surgery. These are the clinical studies that have been completed or are con being conducted to date. So we have three, uh, the first three studies, ROSO1 to ROSO3, were conducted in healthy subjects and in patients with various degrees of renal impairment, essentially characterizing the safety, tolerability and the PK of the molecule. We've done, also completed one study, ROSO4, in the target patient population. So this was a very important yet small proof of principle study for us in the target patient population of cardiac surgery, which has also been completed. Um, what I will speak about today is the Akita study, which is now actively recruiting both in North America and in Europe, which is in essence a large phase two study where we want to evaluate the efficacy of the molecule. Um, as alluded to in my, on my first slide, we also recently initiated ROSO6, which is a separate transplant study, which I will not speak about today. In brief, the uh, data of the phase one program, the comprehensive phase one program, which has now been completed, is that we exposed 52 subjects to the molecule, healthy subjects, renal impaired subjects, cardiac surgery patients. The molecule was assessed as well tolerated across the study populations. We don't have any serious adverse events, which is um, related to the study drug. The PK of the molecule, as alluded to, that's predictable. It's very consistent, uh, where we have a rapid distribution to the kidney. Nevertheless, we also see that the exposure of the molecule, that is the systemic concentrations over time, that is strongly correlated to the renal function, which means we're actually defining the dose. Uh, we had two different start doses in uh, cardiac surgery patients. So on the dosing paradigm, um, we give the first dose um, during the actual surgical procedures. So when the patient is asleep on the surgical table, but before they are connected to the heart-lung machine. That's when we start the first IV infusion. And the idea is that we will get a protection, both systemically, but also precondition the kidney with the molecule once they have this initial large insult. Then the remaining four doses that we give in the phase two is given over 30 minutes, uh, with infusion start at 6, 12, and 24, and 48 hours at the start of the first infusion. And as alluded to, we set two different start doses, 1.3 or 0.65 milligrams per kg, depending on whether the patient has an impaired renal function before they go into surgery. I will only briefly, uh, before going to the Akita study, um, speak about some biomarker findings we had um, in the first, this proof of principle study, ROSO4. This was a small study with 12 subjects, eight received active treatment, four received placebo. We did measure a predefined panel of, of biomarkers in the urine that are reflective of kidney tubular cell stress or injury, uh, which essentially reflects or mimics what we're trying to protect here. And what we did find that we had really quantitative reductions of all these biomarkers with active treatment versus placebo. And as you can see on the, on the graphical depictions here, so if we measure at baseline, which was just before the surgical procedure, 
there's really no measurable signal, neither in the active nor in the, in the placebo group. However, if you look at the change from baseline at four hours, as expected, you have a peak in these biomarkers because they do reflect damage and stress on the kidney. But that signal is really attenuated or even quenched out by the active treatment. So this is very consistent with uh, our beliefs, with the preclinical data and the mode of action. So going into the Akita study, which you will hear a lot more about, this is a very, I th say, um, recognizable study uh, where the main objective is to evaluate, of course, the, the efficacy, but most importantly, the, the safety of the compound in uh, patients undergoing open chest surgery. So we plan to include 268 subjects in a one-to-one -one randomization, uh, half receiving active, half receiving placebo. The primary endpoint in this study is actually AKI according to the clinical definition um, of the global recognized the guidelines that actually defines, provide an exact definition of this. And we assess the primary endpoint at 72 hours after the surgery. So again, very different to any chronic studies. The key secondary endpoints of the study is where we look at kidney function on a continuous scale. So we can look at the post baseline changes in kidney function. We of course not only look at the existence of AKI, but also the duration and the severity of disease. We look at the number of patients who receive dialysis treatment and a composite endpoint called MAKE or major adverse kidney events, which is defined either by death dialysis or at least a 25% GFR decline. So I think the point here is that this will be a very supportive, it's not a pivotal study, but it will be very supportive to future market application uh, or new drug application. And the study design and the robustness of, of this will really provide the best informed and data-driven decision about the phase three design where we can move straight into a pivotal study. And just to give you a graphical overview and again the information of the study flow. So we have a screening period which is allowed to be up to one month, but in practice we really see that the patients come in, they're being screened and randomized just the day before or even on the day of surgery. Then everything happens very intensively over a couple of days um, when the patients are on the surgical table, in the intensive care unit, in a regular post-operative ward until they are discharged about one week after the surgery. So the only thing we really do is to also follow up these subjects at, at day 30 and day 90 after the surgery. So we're trying not to interfere with standard of care, but just make sure we get all the information we need to adequately assess the molecule. So again, very quick timelines, very predictable. We don't wait for the events because the events, they occur immediately after surgery. So we expect to have um, results of this first interim result, which is being produced in the first quarter of 2023, which is in, in less than six months now. Um, and that's based when we included half of the number of subjects. And I think importantly, we know where to find these patients. It's not difficult to find the patients. So the bottleneck in terms of recruitment is more to have the right sites being committed and or having the right staff to collect qualitative data. But so far, recruitment pro projections holds. It goes well. Um, and we're recruiting, as I said, actively both in North America and in Europe. So um, this, these timelines still hold. So the interim analysis will not be shared in full detail, neither to the company nor um, to the external community, because it's a blinded performing by so-called data monitoring committee, where we have three potential outcomes. One is that we continue as planned, up to 268 subjects. However, there's an adaptive element because we, can, we may learn as we go along. So there's a potential that it could be based on predefined criteria to expand the sample size up to 348 pa patients, which is a very clever way to essentially, without paying a statistical penalty, but we can actually uh, make sure we learn as we go along and adapt the trial uh, to increase the likelihood of having a significant primary endpoint. There's also an option to stop the study for safety of utility. Once recruitment are now gradually being picked up, um, as I said, in two continents, uh, usually the recruitment goes much faster in the second half of the study. So we expect to have the fully enrolled study, uh, despite the large patient number uh, towards next summer, uh, with top line results being for, uh, released also um, in the next year. Finally, I just want to mention a couple of, of, of people here. Uh, we recently expanded the management team. We have a world-class and globally leading um, team in place to actually execute the study, but also doing the right science and build the clinical development program. 
and we are well equipped actually to run a pivotal study as well. So we have recently appointed myself, I'm a clinical nephrologist, but we also had Michael Reusch uh, recently appointed as, as a chief medical officer who has a lot of experience uh, in, in drug development, in transplantation and in nephrology over the past 30 years. Um, we also have Peter Gilmore, who's our head of preclinical science, uh, preclinical toxicologist, pharmacologist, working in the same space also both for AstraZeneca mostly and, and, and Astellas. So I think the summary and conclusions, hopefully I've given a good projections of this biotech company where we are. We haven't spoken so much about the science, but I can just try to convince you that we are a first in class drug with very targeted mechanisms that we think is, is ideal, including the biodistribution pattern for the treatment of any AKI, but most importantly, cardiac surgery AKI, which is the first indication we go for. As said, this is a huge commercial potential driven by the large patient numbers. We've done a comprehensive phase program um, where we don't see even the safety signals. It does provide data to support an indication expansion like we already signaled, for example, in kidney transplantation. And we do see an early pharmacodynamic effect based on the biomarker signal. So again, the Akita trial, we are in phase two. Um, I think this might escape the radar, but not in the scientific community. This is a very important study. We're actually writing up a, a design manuscript, which will also eventually be published. Um, and of course, as said, Akita results, that will enable an optimal design and going straight into the pivotal study. So I will have a lot more time to speak about this also with my colleagues. We have a capital market day on September 21st, where we'll go through all the preclinical data, the clinical data, and also the fundamentals of the pricing reimbursement in this space, together with our thinking in the kidney transplant space. So if you're interested in hearing that and getting more into the details behind this, please attend and you can easily register via our website. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Tobias, for this nice presentation. And now we have time for a few questions. And my first question will be on the patient population that you're targeting in your Akita uh, study. And one of the things that society is ex experiencing nowadays, it's um, a, a trend towards a more le like a less invasive surgical procedures, like for example, open chest aortic valve replacement, it's going down, it's more like uh, non-invasive um, valve replacement. And how do you see this uh, affecting guard therapeutics? What's your view on, on, on this trend? So I think there are two things. I think historically there's been a trend, but I think that trend has, has gradually stopped because we see that the numbers are relatively constant. There's been a, a little bit of a dip again during the pandemic, but I think it seems like we're still having the best data and have the best clinical outcomes for patients when things are doing. Certain procedures are still doing uh, with open chest using cardiopulmonary bypass. So I think there's still, a, it, it, this is not going to be eliminated overnight because we have complex surgical procedures which cannot be performed without that. So I think there's still a huge number of patients that will need this in, in the foreseeable future. Secondly though, the only reason we're not including less invasive procedures in the clinical development program, because they also have an AKI risk and we really see this as an opportunity for, for expansion of, of the use of the molecule. But the events are, are slightly less, we have a little bit fewer events with a slightly lower AKI risk, which means that the development program would be larger. So we, we don't include that now until we sort of can, can have the first indication to go to market. But we, we don't see any contradiction here. We think this is a great opportunity. That's, that's very interesting. And my second question is regarding your new, your new study in kidney transplant. Uh, could you expand a little bit, uh, what is the target population and how often these patients that uh, suffer kidney injury and how much is this translated into uh, kidney failure? Yeah. So again, we have time to, to, to speak about this more in, in detail, but in, in brief, what we're trying is to, we, we're targeting deceased donor kidney transplantation because that's when you have the more extensive ischemic injuries because you have a donor in one hospital, there's a procurement team that will actually explant the organs, then it's usually being transported to another clinic where they call in the recipient and then the kidney is being implanted. So obviously during all this time period, there's various methods to try to limit uh, the damages, mm -hmm. but also once it's being implanted and, and connected to the circulatory system in the recipient, that also means there are, are a massive, what we call as an ischemia reperfusion injury in the kidney. So we target deceased donor, probably also with certain risk criteria for developing something called delayed graft function. 
if you look at the numbers, if, if you look in high-risk patients, the, the delayed graft function typically occurs in, in, in 20, up to even to 30% in, in, in high-risk patients. So that, those are the numbers. However, a lot of these patients, they develop a suboptimal kidney function over time. So even if you don't affect this, you know, the dialysis endpoint in the acute phase, you can still change the EGFR, the kidney function, the trajectory over time, which we also is a regulatory approved endpoint. So we think that is also very important when we're going to assess this in, in a proof of concept in the clinical program. Yeah, very interesting. And my third question, uh, it's on, again, on the Akita trial. It's a quite uh, robust trial, varying the number of hundreds of patients. Is there any possibility that you, uh, based on like a very positive data, let's say uh, it comes like that, that you file for accelerated approval or this is not on the table and you would go for sure to a phase three? So obviously we are closely following the regulatory framework and, and, and guidances which may change as we go along. And actually this is one of the reasons we are conducting a large study. Um, I still believe that you know, the primary objective for us is not going and use that as a pivotal study for, for accelerated approval. But as I said, we don't exclude that possibility and it gives us a very good chance if we're not using it as a pivotal, it will be an important study, supportive study. And more importantly, it also gives us the leeway to pinpoint, I mean, if we can have more of it usually refers to as personalized medicine, if we see specific subgroups that respond really well to the treatment, that may actually influence the phase three design. So again, we are well powered to look at certain subgroup analysis and of course we're going to explore biomarker analysis, etc. also in that specific trial. So we see this as a supportive study where we can optimize the phase three design. Yeah. Thank you very much. And still on your clinical trials, uh, still so many companies are experiencing, are experiencing uh, trouble on, on patient recruitment. How is this for you? How are you happy with your recruitment rates? So as alluded to, I think this is really one of the greatest benefits. Of course, one should never, you know, you, yay, we finished the trial until the trial is finished. The Rosso 4 study, just, we did that in a single site in Germany during the pandemic when there was a close down in Germany or a lockdown in Germany. And nevertheless, in this single site, we recruited one patient per week during the pandemic. Now we are targeting obviously a lot more patients, but as I alluded to in my, my, my talk, we still are on projections. So we, we had about now, I think, 50 patients, uh, which is fully in line um, with the projections that we have. So the projections that we will have interesting results produced in, in Q1, as I said, that still holds. So we don't, we don't really see any you know, major change in that. Of course, it could always be certain sites that, that struggles because of the pandemic or there might be other issues. But we also try to mitigate by having large number of sites, validated sites who, who are you know, used to run these kind of trials. Um, and that's currently what we see. That, that's the only thing I can say. So, so far, we, we look good on the recruitment end. Sounds good. And uh, one last question. Um, could you remind uh, your investors uh, what is your current cash position and how is your cash runway looking? Yes, as I alluded to, so we had about 150 million sec in, in cash uh, by end of June. Uh, so that, that's the most recent financial report. So we have a cash runway, which is roughly to the end of the Akita study. I mean, we wouldn't have started that study without the knowledge that, that we should be funded in, in terms of direct cost for the study. So, um, so that, that's where we are. Yeah. And uh, to the point also that this indication and, and this cost per patient that's also less usually than if you compare it to oncology studies or more chronic studies. So that, that provides yet another benefit when you run trials in this space. Tobias, thank you very much for being here today and for your presentation. Thank you.